good kill. Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to another video. Today we're talking with Nick Gray, the CEO of Eagle Dynamics. And really, I, I invited him out because I wanted to talk to him a little bit about the future of DCS. Um, we've heard a lot about some interesting things on the horizon, some big steps for DCS in the future. And uh, I thought it would be really cool to have the CEO here to explain some stuff and uh, their roadmap and the things that they want to work on. So Nick Gray, welcome. Yeah, and thanks for the invitation. It's my pleasure. You're very welcome. Um, what is the number one priority for ED right now in regards to DCS's development other than bug fixes? Because we all know you guys are focusing very hard on the bug fixes, and um, let's just pretend that that gets fixed. Um, what do you move on to? What is your next issue? What is the number one priority after bug fixes? Um, well, I think, uh, I don't think, it's possible actually to solve all bugs. <laughs> That'll be a never ending story. But um, if I were to imagine our top priorities in terms of the uh, impact on the product and not in terms of money spend, let's talk about impact on the product. The number one priority is, uh, is definitely the uh, the multi-threading, um, uh, the new graphics engine, and uh, and so on. I think that that's where the uh, the the biggest impact will be seen and felt, at least by uh, by our by our customers. Um, but of course, that's not where we're spending the most money because it can't be. You know, uh, we still have to a business to run, and so we still need to work on on. Uh, uh, on modules and uh, product enhancements, but in terms of priority, which will make the biggest impact, multi-threading, Vulcan, probably water as well. Now you said one, but I think it all goes in in in, in that sort of graphics performance um, uh, 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 pack, if you wish. Right. So so DCS's performance and just overall appearance, you would say, is higher up on the priority list. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the 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 hardware in terms of CPU uh, capabilities isn't getting much better, but you know, the graphics cards are you're making leaps and bounds, and we need to be able to take advantage of of that tech, in, you know, and and VR is becoming so important um, uh, that we really have to uh, enhance our graphics experience if we're to compete. Right. Okay. Uh, where do you see DCS in two to three years from now? Uh, well, that's that's a difficult question to ask. I don't know. I mean, we in two years, if I look back two years ago when I um, inherited this um, management opportunity, because prior to that, you know that it was my founding partner, Igor Titian, who was the CEO, yes. and he passed away. And so in March, about two years ago, um, uh, I nominated uh, Katya as the COO, and I took a, a role as CEO. It's not my day job. This is very much my um, uh, uh, nighttime job. I've got other things to do, uh, which keeps me in hot dinners, if you wish. This is more of a passion. But... Um, where do I see it in two years? Well, two years ago, we um, we were essentially one quarter of the size we are today. Um, we doubled in size and in numbers. Um, when I say numbers, it's products sold in the first year uh, since Katya took over. And we doubled again um, in the next 12 months. Will that continue? I don't think so. Um, I don't think it's possible, to be honest. I mean, um, in two years, I think in terms of user base, we might be double what we have today. Um, maybe, I hope so. Uh, we certainly are investing a lot in, in the future. Um, you know, we're not distributing any profits or anything like that. It's all being reinvested directly back in the engine and the modules and the people, basically. So I don't know. I hope that we'll have a bigger user base. I, I hope that we'll um, we won't make any fundamental mistakes and uh, and ruin the relationship with our community, which is everything to us. 
Um, we listen very carefully. Uh, we're very attentive, and uh, um, and we hope to strike a balance between um, fixing what we've got and enhancing what we've got and offering new products. Um, we've got plenty in the pipeline, not only internally, but also with our third parties. I think there'll be some interesting news in the coming weeks as well with regards to third party um, modules uh, coming out. Uh, will we have a whole world engine like Microsoft? Uh, highly unlikely. That's an absolutely daunting task, but we definitely want something, you know, we just don't have the money or the resources of, uh, of MSFS, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we, we, we need to be humble, uh, we need to be realistic, and we need to spend the money we have, uh, not the money we don't have. We're not that kind of organization. And, uh, and keep on being faithful to the principles that, uh, that, we, uh, that we set ourselves, which is realism. Um, and, um, and at the same time, uh, 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 you know, professionalism. We do have a military clientele that we need to look after and enhance. Um, and we try to strike a balance, I think, between those uh, those applications and our faithful community uh, in the entertainment um, sector. So I can't answer clearer than that because it's uh, it's a it's a bit of a moving feast, shall we say? Um, is ED working on a new render graph engine, quote unquote, to better optimize DCS, and will this lead to better graphics and overall performance? which I think you already kind of answered in the question before. Yeah, I, I, I think we kind of did. Yes is the answer, obviously. We are working on a new render graph engine. It's very important uh, to take advantage of modern technology. Um, and, and we are very confident that it will enhance performance substantially and take advantage of all these new architectures and graphics cards. So um, it, it, it is a priority. It's not a... It's not a trivial task because we, you know, as you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of legacy code that we need to make sure um, doesn't break or doesn't create any clogs and so on, and um, and and so it, it it is something that we need to be wary of. But it's uh, it, it's an absolute yes, and the performance will be substantially enhanced. Wonderful. Um, we've heard a lot about a DCS campaign engine. Uh, is this something that ED is working on, some sort of dynamic campaign, single player, multiplayer kind of thing? And uh, if yes, what is your vision for what that would look like when it comes to DCS? What will it offer? Well, it's it, it will be different to um, BMS or Falcon 4 in many ways. Um, primarily because we're a real-time engine, which means you know you can jump from one product to another um, at any time, which is very different from from uh, from Falcon, where uh, you know everything happens in these kind of bubbles, right? But it's very believable and very good fun, and and I absolutely love the product and the fact that it's being maintained in this way by the community is pretty incredible, actually. So it's not going to be uh, similar in any respect to uh, to that. So it, 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 when calling it a dynamic campaign, um, I think it'll be a little bit different. It's um, it, it's more of a, a, a strategy type layer that combines you know action between military forces um, with an economical layer, if you wish. Um, with production and transfer of resources and, and assets are basically resources. And those assets are ground assets. They're also um, air assets. They're, but, but they include fuel, ammunition, um, pilots. You know, if you're doing, uh, if you're adding multiplayer with uh, with mission planning. So um, it, it, it basically um, um, uh, more realistic um, plan as well which you use the assets that you have in the in the starting scenario and then 
it dynamically will enhance those assets depending on certain economical rules. And hopefully in the end, we'll have another layer which will be morale and all of those other tipping points that you, you sometimes hear about. I think the game contains obviously, you know, uh, a number of side, blue, red, green, and so on. And in, like any other game, um, uh, it's based on actions and counteractions. And you know how the mission planner works today. I mean, um, AI is, is, is obviously not sufficiently smart to behave um, instinctively in the right way. You still have to mission plan today, but in the future, um, a squadron of aircraft on the ground with pilots that are good to go. Let's imagine you've got um, uh, a morning strike uh, being made in, uh, on a particular um, port, for example, and the nearby airfield has 12 interceptors and, uh, uh, and, and the early warning system recognizes that there's a, there's a strike, then it would scramble the assets automatically, you don't have to plan it and 12 SUs or whatever they would be would go and intercept. Um, and depending on the intelligence level, which is all to do with what are the assets available to gather that intelligence. Um, obviously, we're not talking about human intelligence, it's mainly sensor intelligence here we're talking about. So it's either early warning aircraft that are in the in the air, or there's early warning radar background based, or there's a network of of uh, uh, SAM sites talking to each other and so on. And they will then action reaction type um, uh, warfare um, with obviously uh, an aggressor and a defender. So somebody who wants to take over a particular terrain physically, which would involve also troops in the future, but in the beginning, it's an air campaign, of course. Um, uh, and then a defender who believes that um, the aggressor should be kept at bay. And um, and obviously, you know, every action always leads to slightly different results, as you know. You know, not every egg's a chicken. You know, sometimes it doesn't quite work as you plan. And so the different pictures on the map um, will, um, depending on uh, what happens, will always evolve, and uh, and as a result, will you know, will develop infinite number of outcomes. And I I think that the vision. For the, for the product is pretty broad um, and, and pretty big. Um, and we've been at it now for two years, solid. Uh, small team, dedicated team in, uh, in, uh, in Siberia that's working on it with a, a team lead based in Moscow. Um, and you have to imagine technically, without going into great detail, that the, the game engine is based on graph technology. So where the edges are, all the routes on the map, with roads, railroads, bridges, airs, and whatnot, even sea routes, if you wish. And the nodes are crossroads, points of interest, you know, stuff like that, right? And, and so um, as a result, we, you, you know, you can imagine stuff moving around logistically, providing um, resources and assets to particular areas. Um, of strategic value. So let's call it the strategic layer works with, um, in that sense, relatively simplified maps in the beginning. You know, the edges of the graph, as we said, which are the routes and so on, are auto-created from actual road structures, right? So a road network, which we have in, in DCS maps, as you, as you know, um, uh, that, that road could be today absolutely open but tomorrow it could be bombed so you can't have heavy duty lorries going on it or a bridge could be destroyed and so that the supply route would no longer be be you know available for logistics you know maybe it would mean that uh, spare parts couldn't arrive to the air to the base or whatever and of course this um um the objective of of a particular um uh, uh let's call it campaign, can be related to specific nodes alone. So it doesn't have to be something massive. It can be limited, for example, to a small campaign, which would be take control of a port. And the port in, involves a variety of nodes, um, not only um, the actual harbor itself, where you can come and dock boats and whatnot. So that involves, you know, uh, also the, 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 the fuel 
um, reserves on the port and it you know, involves also the railroad network that brings it to the port and so on. So if the objective is to take control of the port, um, or, you know, that on its uh, all on its own could be a, a campaign, if you wish, and could last a long time. Um, you can just consider it. So anyway, all the in-game processes can, can be divided, if you wish, in that sense, as a result into economic and military operations. So that's that's the vision of it, um, and it's it, it's it's much bigger than than we ever planned it to be, and and in some ways I think it's more ambitious than than we planned it to be. But um, we're we're on the road, and it's moving, and um, and uh, and you know we're watching it grow, and we're watching you know e e each week. We have a, a specific briefing, and I get to look in every now and again, on uh, and be able to witness some of the some of the the big successes which are being made, and some of the setbacks where we make assumptions that don't necessarily come come true. But all I can say is it's a big deal. Um, in the stage of development today is we've got the base um, RTS logic and connection to DCS is pretty much ready. The base economic smoke engine is ready. The create, save, load campaign via the DCS mission editor is basically ready, except for final dis the visuals. Obviously, but the interface is not finalized by it. The combat operations logic is in progress. The win-win situation logic is obviously to do, the user connection is to do bubble restrictions for single player. That means, you know, what is the area of operations? You don't go out of there and so on. There's still to do. And also the client server architecture to support very large campaigns within continuous online sessions, if you wish, because that's the holy grail. That's where you want to go. You want to be able to create a world a bit like a serial campaign which would involve Israel, you know, Lebanon, maybe Turkey, US, maybe from a, from from aircraft carrier operations and so on. You just want to be able to turn up and go and have fun. And when you turn up, you get, you, you know, you get a, a selection of things that are available to you for that particular day or for that particular moment in time, and you choose depending on the aircraft that you possess. You know, if you've bought a F-18 only, then obviously you're not going to be offered F-16 operations, are you? Um, and then that's it. Within that, um, you might have three or four different missions available to you. You might have a, uh, you know, a ship strike or a, or a close air support or interdiction or I don't know. Um, and then you just jump in and off you go. And, and it just it evolves all on its own. And the, the objective is to have as little as possible human intervention because human intervention costs money because it means people watching these things permanently, making corrections, and, you know, because nothing's perfect, and tuning it so it's really balanced, you know, because you might have um, something which is poorly conceived and you might have a whole squadron which is wiped out by one super bomb, um, and that's the end of that, and because it's been you might not have sufficient assets to make it balanced. So, you know, we try to make it as automated as, and as AI friendly as possible. But in order for it to be big, we have to do quite a substantial revamp of our general AI. And there are two levels to that. There's obviously the, you know, the pilot AI, and then there's the ground AI, the behavior of the tanks, the this, the that, you know, all the ground AI. And pilot AI is a big deal because it hasn't been substantially overhauled for poof, eight years, something like that. So that's ongoing as well. Anyway, there you go. Well, that uh, that kind of brings us to the next question. And that was, um, will we be seeing any new AI behavior in DCS? And in what sense will they be better if you want to make them better? And one of the things that you know, I learned when I was dogfighting, for example, was you always practice with the AI first. And then when you can reliably kill the AI, you come and you start fighting, you know, real people and you get into PvP stuff. And that's obviously because the AI just isn't is probably not for another 100, maybe 10, 20 years before we get some sort of sentient AI. Is it going to be as intelligent as a real human being? Um, and that will leave that up to Elon Musk. 
But uh, when it comes to this stuff, I like I, I always wondered like because dog fighting is such a fluid thing. It's not like I do this so you do that. It's almost like some sort of like you know dance in the air, and it's so so difficult to make an AI be able to read that fluidity of a dog fight and behave correctly to it. Um, like it's got to be some next level programming. So I, I would imagine that making you know, really, really intelligent pilot AI would be difficult. Um, is that something you guys are working on? And if so, how will it be better than it is now? Well, I mean, you you figured it out um, uh, and and answered already half the question. The it is non-trivial. It is a a big task. Luckily, we have um, uh, a guy who's the lead on this who's absolutely excellent. Um, whether he'll be able to make, you know, orders of magnitude changes to the quality of the, um, the AI, I don't know, um, short term, excuse me, let me just kill this. Um, but, um, I'm confident, um, that he will make substantial changes. And that means that um, some of the decisions which are being made today are just simply stupid. The pilots will do things which put them into, you know, easy kill um, situations. Uh, and and those have to first be eliminated. So all of the, let's say if there were, there, there, there were steps to be made, the first ones is let's eliminate the stupid decisions as as much as possible, you know, going into some kind of silly climb um, with an aircraft that's underpowered when compared to its opponent is is a waste of space, right? Uh, and those sort of things. And in order to eliminate stupid decisions, you have to understand who your opponent is. So there's, there's, there's opponent matching um, algorithms that have to be created. Today, the AI behaves pretty much in an identical fashion, regardless of the enemy, if you see what I mean. That means that if you're fighting, uh, if you're in an F-15 and you're fighting a Vigan, um, you know, the Vigan will behave in a similar way as if it was fighting another Vigan. Do you know what I mean? It's yep. like silly. Um, when it should be behaving in a completely different way, basically just hitting full power and trying to outrun its opponent and not getting into a turning fight um, and vice versa, you know? Um, so we have to give it much more an understanding as who am I fighting? If I'm in a F-16 and my opponent's a MiG-21, it's a completely different ball game. Um, the only choice for the MiG-21 is to just go as fast as possible out of dodge and disappear. There is no fight, you know? Um, and getting into one is a just tactical error. So the tactical layer, shall we say, is who am I fighting against? What is my critical behavior? What are the mistakes I should make needs to be eliminated first? So that's the first job. The second job then is, you know, understanding what are my circumstances here from, because everything depends on the kickoff, as you know more, better than anybody, depending on the circumstances of the initial um, situation, everything changes, you know, in a perfect world where it's merge, same altitude, same way, same day, same speed type stuff, which is the way we play often, very different from if somebody creeps up on you and, you know, uh, and, and you, you see it at the last moment, because basically it's on your tail. So you got to behave completely differently than if it's a head on fight. And so that whole what are the initial circumstances um, need to be improved dramatically as well, right? Once you've sorted out the initial circumstances, I think then that you can start working on some of the golden rules of, you know, am I, am I an angles fighter? Am I a rate fighter? You know, who am I? Who is my opponent? What am I going to get into? I'm going to start, you know, is a two circle flight, one, you know, fight, one circle, where am I at? What, what, what is my status? Aha. Now I know I can behave in a certain way and win. So very simple principles at this stage are what we're trying to break the new AI into. And then we can start fine tuning. 
The good news is that the flight envelopes which we have in our aircraft are pretty precise. And so we have feedback from SMEs who will say, yeah, but no, you know, Mirage 2000 just will not fight like that against an F-15. We wouldn't do that. Or, you know, uh, a MiG-29 just would not get into that kind of a fight um, and expect to win against... Uh, against an F-14, you know, and stuff like that. Because it's not only, you know, guns. It's all of the, you know, what kind of missiles do I expect this guy to have on board? Uh, you know, if you if you, <laughs> just imagine you're in a, you're in the UK airspace. I'm just giving you a, uh, an example of, of, of modern combat and you, you know you're going to come up against a, uh, Typhoon 2s, you know they don't have the Meteors yet, fully operational. So you know it's going to be more of an AMRAM type long range fight. And if it degrades to close combat, it's going to be more of an AIM-9X type thing. But imagine one year from now and then, and then the Meteors have been deployed everywhere. Well, you're toast, right? So you don't even go there. And that kind of fundamental AI decision making is, is essential to make the game more realistic well that, so we're working on that and it's a it's a it's a long-term process and um it's an exciting one but it's a very technical one um and as you said um somebody else who's smarter and richer than us is going to succeed in doing it perfectly but we're going to do our best yeah it, it seems like a daunting task but uh, uh i'm sure you guys can figure it out thank you um, so this next question, uh, this one's kind of close to me personally, cause you've seen from the channel, I'm very of an air to air guy. So the most recent and most welcome changes to the AMRAM that you guys did recently, that was the increase of the range and, uh, all that stuff. Uh, you made the AMRAM seem like in the past, the AMRAM's effective range, honestly, pretty high was like 15 to 17 miles, which, you don't need classified uh, data to know that that's not entirely accurate. And so ED took the next step and they made the AMRAM better. And so now we get realistic kills like I'm on I'm uh, on my server reliably getting 60 mile AMRAM kills now, which is incredible. Um, I'm having a great time with that. So the question is, having upgraded the AMRAM, um, this has placed the Russian aircraft at a pretty major disadvantage with their missiles because um, they haven't received that update, uh, is is DCS, especially in a multiplayer arena as well, right? Like AI is a little different, but when you come to a multiplayer arena, um, it's, it's nice to have uh, a competitive enemy. And so I guess the question is, are there any plans to improve Russian missiles, um, or maybe the addition of new ones, um, such that the flanker and the MiG can once again be competitive in a multiplayer environment? Yeah, this is the, this is the play balance type question versus um, realism. Uh, what we have decided internally two years ago is we're actually not going to do the play balance thing so much um, anymore. Um, we're going to uh, do our best to deliver something which is as realistic as possible. Uh, and as such, um, we started with the AMRAM not only be because we knew it was wrong, but um, it, we, it, it, it just needed doing professionally. And we're going to do the same for all of the, let's call them modern missiles, uh, which means we, um, because we don't have access to classified data, so we have to reverse engineer everything. Uh, there are open sources which gives you um, an, an idea, but the rest is done in a pretty um, scientific fashion. We take the weight of the uh, uh, of the missile, which is known. Um, uh, we take the length, the size, the, the all of the parameters, the aileron size, and so on. We take the seeker head size. We know the fuel mass, more or less. We know the type of fuel. And, and we build a, a CFD model um, and, uh, uh, and, and then we program the particular warhead, uh, the, the particular navigation system 
to behave in a correct fashion. So we know all the drag and lift curves and thrust data and so on, all the polar data. Um, and then it's all about, you know, what are the various modes of the missile? You know, how, how do they launch? Do they loft? Do they have inertial navigation? You know, what are the various modes? And, and we look at it in a much more detailed fashion in order to create something which is as close as possible to reality. Now, we're never going to get anybody from Raytheon or any of these companies saying, yeah, well done, lads, you know, spot <laughs> on. Um, yeah. But what we are going to get, um, and 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 we never get it openly in writing or anything, but we, we can see the faces on the, the SMEs and our friends who are fighter pilots or ex-fighter pilots where they go, yeah, yeah, this is spot on. Or, that's weird, you know, we never get lofts this close. You know, don't bother. It only goes in the loft at a particular you know, range where it needs that extra range when it's a close infight, you know, no way. And and so what we do is we go in this iterative process towards something that's as close as possible to reality. Now, that, as you know, there are very few um, open sources for U.S. missiles, but it's exactly the same for the Russian missiles. And so we have to do the job for the Russian missiles and 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 do it well. And and in and in the end, what you'll have if you have a multiplayer server is you have a situation where yes, red, blue, they'll be different, but the tactics in order to win should be different as well as a result. And so, what you're now doing is you're actually starting to behave in a much more realistic environment, having to take up tactics which are closer to reality in order to win. And that's what I was talking about earlier. It's like, well, who am I up against? How do I have to behave? It's not simply, I've got a big gun and I can, I can shoot you know, further. It means that I know who I'm up against from intelligence or from a a a AWACS or whatever, and therefore I'm going to behave in a different way. And yes, that Amram can reach out and touch me, but if I do something different, maybe I have a chance of getting into a fight into an area where he won't be able to uh, necessarily get at me that easily. And then I've got a, maybe a better close-up missile or I've got a better turning aircraft or I've got a smaller radar signature aircraft, which will give me better chances. And You know, you start behaving in a different manner to reflect survivability as in the real world. Uh, not only survivability, but... Um, you know, uh, aggressive uh, capabilities as well. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's really nice to hear that ED doesn't plan to um, balance DCS as if it's uh, it's battlefield or something. Um, obviously, people come here because they want the experience of real life. Um, I think once you guys, because uh, I was talking to some other guys, some of the mods, and they were saying that there is some sort of work being done on Russian missiles. Now, I'm sure that just means improvement of guidance and maybe some aerodynamics changes. Uh, but once that's all sorted out, um, I like I remember when the SD10 came out with the Jeff uh, JF17. Everybody was like, "Oh, it's it's not fair," and it's like, "Yeah, it, I, I was under the impression that like war is not supposed to be fair." You know, it's the whole point of constantly improving your technology. Um, so it's really nice to hear that uh, ED's not going to be doing that. Yeah, and I all my miss discussion is a big one, by the way, because you know in the end, they're, they're truly deadly weapons and so on. And and it, it's one of the reasons why, you know, we've been having a little bit of uh, uh, of stress with our good friends from China and, you know, even the Russian players, they feel a little bit at a disadvantage. And whatnot. And everybody would like to make their jet or their missile perform better than in reality. And I've just said, look, we have to stop this absolutely. There is no better. You know, we have to deliver something which is as close as reality as possible. Why? Because then our customers, our users, will feel better about their purchase. They'll feel that it has more value, intrinsic value. And, um, and they will enjoy the good, the bad, and the ugly of a particular aircraft, get to know it, and then genuinely have a feeling that they have learned something that was part of history or is part of modern day operations. And as a result, you know, they'll come away with a more genuine experience. It's exactly the same as Second World War fighters, you know. Um, in many products that are out there, you, you, you can fly around in these things and it's just, and I've flown 
tens, dozens of fighters, Second World War, and I, and I just go, funny, I don't remember it being like this. <laughs> and so you, you come away with maybe a gaming satisfaction, but you don't come away with the learned satisfaction, where you have the feeling that you've learned something genuine of historical value or of current operational value. So we're really trying to push all our friends to say, look, let's just try, and all our developers, let's just try and stick with the truth as much as possible. Let's not try and invent a missile which goes twice as far as it should, um, just by tweaking the, you know, the, the 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 drag index. You know, like stop that. You know, let's focus on reality, and the reality is good enough, and you will sell more product as a result because people will feel genuinely satisfied that this is not a, a cheat or a, you know an, uh, they'll feel that it's 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 a valuable honest product and that's what we have to get to and we have to we have to motivate everybody to to focus on that on that internally as well as externally yes and i think the community not only is not stupid but would be very upset if all of a sudden a module came out and in order to make it sell you know, it, it was given a really, really good missile. For example. You know, it's like, it's very obvious what's going on here. It's not realistic. It's a selling point. That's why it was done. So I think uh, that's also an important point where the community would be like, okay, if it's got a good missile, based on ED's reputation, they try to make everything realistic. If it's got a good missile, it's probably because they have data to support it. And so that's great. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so this is a big one uh, that the community really was pushing for. Um, DCS Open Beta recently uh, came out with a lot of bugs. Um, so what are, it was more like the bugs just kind of kept building up and building up. And um, what are ED's plans to deal with these bugs, which we've already talked about a little bit. And um, what changes are you guys going to be making to ensure that we have less bugs in the open beta in the future? Yeah, um, I think what happened, the difference between 2.55 and 5.6 looks like just one digit, right? Um, but in fact, it was a, a pretty radical set of changes um that came out and it was it was just a bigger piece of and and harder piece of meat to chew than we expected what we have done now um following that rather poor open beta release i have to say is we've said okay stop um the release cycle will be shorter and this is a hot fix for something we didn't find and that's dramatic um, uh, um, when I say shorter, um, uh, it, it will be the amount of stuff we try and produce or deliver will be less uh, important. Um, we'll say we'll cut off the 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 work to two weeks, and then we test for two weeks. Whereas before we were kind of coding until the very end, we now we say, okay, this is the the, the feature list that we're going to deliver, or we're going to aim to deliver, and let's go out and test it. And the whole process is therefore longer. Um, the list of objectives to try and bug fix is therefore written out and everybody goes away and tries to improve on them. And the list of features that we expect to deliver is also limited. And then we go off and focus on that and then test, 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 test. And I think the most recent examples of uh, open beta uh, have proven that that's probably a wise thing. Um, and we're going to continue in that in that direction. Um, it does mean that maybe you know certain people are not going to be able to see features as fast as we had hoped. But um, in the end, the satisfaction of not having something broken is um, is definitely there. There's nothing more frustrating than than receiving something that's more broken than than when you last played with it, right? But we want to get away from that. <laughs> and so we're going to be doing much more testing and we're involving more testers, external testers, because we just simply can't afford um, to have so many internal testers, um, quality people. So we're getting together a very good team of external beta testers, which are being well managed, I think. Um, and, uh, and the results are fantastic, especially um, because the perception from the team when you've got a good bunch of, you know, 30, 40 
50 external testers all playing on multiplayer um when we watch and see what happens it's it's just it just feels much more real it, it, you can actually see it happen and we've got observers who then say aha i can see that bug i see that's a problem and so when it's written up it, it's 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 understood much better than if somebody just puts a bug through the system and then you know and it's like okay well what is it what is the bug and then you've got to replicate it and then you know what i mean so we've got a better system for understanding bugs and therefore the speed of squashing them is is improved um yeah, that's about it, really. We just got to focus on that and bring the the the, the bug numbers down, because otherwise, um, it, it it just becomes a pain. Um, open beta is a very important um, reality for many people. Say, oh, you know, um, why didn't you just go straight to stable and so on and so forth? Um, the psychology of most of our users is, um, uh, and the and and the know how of our community is such that that they are actually demanding um, a bunch, um, and, and rightly so. And anything which is available and, uh, and should be made available, um, obviously not at the cost of breaking the game, right? So when we do have something, a feature, for example, on a missile, a Maverick, or this or that, and it comes out, as long as we don't find or uh, too many bugs or any stop bugs, we'd like to have it out to the community so that they can enjoy it. Um, and that's the role of open beta. Um, what we have also decided, I think, wisely is to say, okay, we need to update stable more quickly within a month or two, not wait six months or five months or whatever, so that so that people who don't want to be on the uh, open beta and take the risk of breaking the machine because they are, you know, big downloads, big versions, and not everybody can have, you know, 1.5 um, terabytes of stuff of various versions. Of, yes, right. Um, uh, so we do need to update the stable faster. Um, and we're going to be focusing on doing that, you know, one to two months, you know, within a one or two month period making it um, a, a much better experience for our users. Right. And obviously the less bugs you put out through the system, the easier it'll be to update stable. So it's kind of like a, a cycle in that sense. That's correct. Alrighty. So um, we've heard a lot about Mac. And for those who don't know what that is, that's modern air combat. Um, is this still in the works? Is it going to be a part of DCS? Is it going to be a standalone game slash sim? Um, what is your vision for Mac and what is ED trying to achieve with this new game and sim? Well, let's start with, with that. Um, what are we trying to achieve? I think that there's a very big community of people who've either tried aerial combat um, uh, and, and just said it's not for me um, um, or have tried it and said, oh, I like this, um, and tried it probably at the lower end with, you know, War Thunder and Ace Combat and so on, and seen the next step up, which is probably DCS, as being way too steep a change, way too much for them. And so Mac is a stepping stone, ultimately, from the arcade products, you know, the the aerial shoot 'em ups if you wish to something like dcs so we want to create offer a lot of realism but packaged um in a in a slightly more simple interface so the mission editor substantially simpler the interface in general much more of a i think you use the word battlefield desk type environment so it feels younger as well um and give people an opportunity to have a less shocking experience. Because when you switch on DCS as a newcomer, well, it's daunting. It's just like, whoa, I mean, how do I start this thing? How do I get my throttle stick? And like, oh, la, la, forget it. Forget it. And so that's, that, that, that's why we, you know, we look at the downloads of our product, and we look at the conversion rates and so on, and, and, and we, we saw it, you know, uh, two, three years ago. So we've got a problem here. Too many people are just not 
converting and staying with it because it's too complex when you interview them. They just say it's the, the learning curve is way too steep. Once you're in and you're hooked, then it becomes a hard drug and people often stay. And if you look at the buying behavior of our community, very, very rare that people stay with one aircraft. Very rare. Typically, it's three, four, five, six and more modules, you know, because they, they then become in, they, they become professional and they understand you know and it's a it's it's a very interesting behavior but getting to that stage is tough there's a certain mastery if you wish which is required and that's the role of modern air combat it's to offer a package and we'll be probably trying to do it with second world war in the future which we'll be calling flying legends but it's not coming out for a, you know, for a while but and that will be a a, a batch of aircraft eight to ten airplanes in some ways simplified, that means, you know, switchable cockpits and so on would be available. So it'll be to um, uh, uh, what we have in Flaming Cliffs from a from a switchology point of view, you know, um, but just packaged in a much better way. So, yes, it's a it's an independent product in that sense, but it lives very much with the um, the 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 style, um, uh, all of the flight models, all of those things will be you know the real thing, but there will be more game available to the user, and that's one of the reasons why it's taken us so long. In the beginning, we thought it would be a flight, you know, a, a flaming cliffs four type product, right? But in fact, we realised that that's not what customers need. They don't need flaming cliffs four. Which is just, you know, they need the flaming kiss will continue. What they need is a is a is a stepping stone from War Thunder before getting to DCS. Right. So it's a it's a in between of War Thunder and DCS with an effort to convert more of those people to DCS. That's the basic logic behind it. That's correct. Will we achieve? I don't know. Yeah, and to be honest, I think it's a it's a great point. I remember when I first opened up. Um, I think the first module I bought was the F-15, which is um, FC-3. And I remember looking at the cockpit and being like, oh, my God, like, do they expect me to learn all this? And, you know, and then I found out it's FC-3 and it's a little bit more simple. So I I managed to understand that. But I I do understand. I see in the comment section a lot people being like, oh, it's it's kind of daunting. Like, what do I do to learn? And uh, so I think it's a great it's a great idea to have an in between of War Thunder and DCS. And from a price point as well, you see, um, GS. I think that um, it's also you know we've got an expensive product. It's not. I mean, even if you look at the sales, not everybody's just going to buy a thirty buck or fifty buck thing for one airplane um, in the beginning. And so here, the value proposition is so much bigger um, because they, it, it just looks like many more aircraft and so on, but it is substantially simplified in that sense. But they will learn, you know, 13 or 14 or 15 aircraft in a, in a much more spoon-fed fashion and a much more fun game, let's go out and do some cool stuff fashion. And, and, and very rapidly, I think, they'll be asking themselves, I wonder what the real thing feels like, you know? Uh, and then they'll maybe go online and they'll ask questions, maybe go on Hoggit and ask questions or go on your site and say, think, and, and, and you'll advise, well, I would start with this and blah, 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 and bingo. Now you convert. Yep. Yep. I think it's a great point. And, a, and a, it's an important step because I think you're right. There is definitely a gap between, the more arcade style quote unquote simulators that they like to call themselves. And then when you come to DCS, it's a whole different thing. It's just so different. Um, so I think it's a great idea to, to have something in the middle there. Uh, moving on to the last question here. Um, what is your vision for DCS World War II in the next year? And um, are we going to see new assets, uh, modules? Because I know ED has very obviously been focusing on the World War II side of things, you know, with the addition of the P-47 and the channel map and um, a lot of actually new World War II assets that we've gotten. Are there plans to expand this further? And what is that vision for you guys? Well, when we dipped our finger or our toe into this water, we did it primarily because, you know, I love World War II fighters above and beyond 
um, all other aviation. It really is the the you know the stuff of legend, you know. And I've had the the, the privilege of uh, of flying a lot of these things personally, um, from Spitfire to Mark One, Mark Two, Mark Five, Mark Nine, Mark Fourteen. Mark 18, you know, a, a lot of different spits, Hurricane 12, Hurricane 4, um, uh, B model Mustang, C model, uh, D model Mustang, uh, Hawk 75, you know, P40B, P40M, P40F, uh, you know, lots and lots of different airplanes. And, and they're great fun and they're challenging, you know, um, and I, and I really think we need to try and, how can I say, persevere and deliver, um, a really good set of second world war fighters, um, with high fidelity flight models and systems. And as it grows, I, I think then we'll be able to have a, a much bigger community and evolve um, uh, into being a much bigger player in that space. So that's our objective. The next aircraft we're going to deliver is uh, the Mosquito. I've never flown the Mosquito. Uh, we did own one for a while, which we then sold on. But we do have some fantastic friends who've got a lot of time in the Mosquitoes, including you know the great Steve Hinton and people like that. And so we've got a lot of data, you know, a huge amount of uh, of test data as well and build data for the mosquito. So I think that's going to be a sensational model, fighter bomber version. Um, and um, and after that, well, um, you know, we, we are thinking of doing a, a Battle of Britain type um, scenario, um, which I think is important, when a, one of the most important air battles of uh, in history, probably one of the most in, important battles in the Second World War, um, absolutely. Um, and so we want to do that. Um, uh, we want to do a number of things which are iconic eras uh, for iconic aircraft and then just poodle along and see how it goes. You know, um, the new damage model that we're developing, by the way, for all our aircraft will be rolled out soon for the Second World War aircraft. And that will make the fun of flying and fighting um, uh, much bigger, I think. Um, a much, much, much more um, fun experience, um, uh, and and in general, we just want to make that Second World War era um, uh, an exciting one, and 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 not geeky, but you know, for guys who really love the hardware, love the period as well historically, um, and then just slowly grow and grow and grow. Yeah, I'm uh, super excited for ED's World War II stuff. We were talking a little bit before about how I started when I was a, a kid in the World War II sims of the 1990s. So uh, really looking forward to that. I'd love to replicate that experience again for myself. Fabulous. Uh, well, that's all I got for you, Nick. Uh, is there anything that you want to voice, any final thoughts and comments for the community, anything on your mind? Well, uh, apart from thank you to the community, that's the main thing that I keep on saying all the time. You know, I'm always just super, super thankful for their passion, for their support, for, you know, and for being tolerant with us as well, because we know we're not perfect and we've got a long way to go. Um, it's, it's a passion for us, our team, we have 148 girls and guys, actually we're 150 now. Um, and there, a lot of these people have been with us for more than 20 years. You know, it's an old team. We're bringing in new blood all the time. Um, uh, they're very passionate about the space. A lot of these guys are aviation engineers. have got a background in, you know, aeronautical sciences, they, they love the stuff they're doing. Um, it's been difficult these last four months. We haven't been able to go back to our offices. We're still in lockdown. We're not going back to the office still now. So it's been a really tough thing. It's one of the reasons why 2.5.6 was a bit dodgy. I think it was the first real big update that we did from lockdown. Um, so it's been tough. Um, um, but we're thankful to the community and all our friends and passionate YouTubers like yourself who, who really make this genre 
a, a, a vibrant and exciting space um, and long may it last. Anyway, thank you to everybody. Thanks to you, GS. You do an absolutely stellar job and um, I watch all your stuff religiously every time I'm a I'm a big supporter of uh, close air combat and uh, and your style of fighting is pretty good. I mean, you're pretty unbeatable, but uh, um, unless it's a guy like Ate chewing your butt. Uh, um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, welcome to the real world, boy. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's he's true. good. He's good. Anyway, there it is. So thanks to everybody and um, uh, be in touch. Speak to you soon. All right, guys, uh, there you have it. That's going to wrap up our interview here today. Big thank you to Nick Gray for coming out and taking time out of his day to explain to us a little bit about what ED is thinking about the future of DCS. Um, some really good things on the horizon there, and uh, very excited to see that stuff uh, get implemented. Um, big thank you to all of you for watching the video, and uh, I hope you found it uh, useful. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.